Hi everyone, this is Dan. Welcome back to our study on the Minor Prophets. This is session four. It's our old fashioned Bible study and we've got the book of Amos tonight. It's lengthy, so we're gonna jump in real quick, but remember the premise of this is the prophetic word of God. It speaks not only to our world, but to our culture, to collectively what we call the church, but also to us as individuals. So as we pray, we're praying that God would speak to our hearts tonight as we study his word. So Jesus, we pray that as we go through the book of Amos, that our ears would be open, that we would be perceptive to see and hear the things that you have for, yes, our world, uh, by all means, what you're speaking to our culture here in America, uh, regarding the church, but as important as all those things are to our hearts as well. So be with us, and it's in your name we pray, amen. So question, who the heck is Amos, by the way, before we get started, grab the PDF PowerPoint. It's got photos and it's got more information, especially as we go through some of these longer books. I shoot for that 45 minute window for a YouTube and there's no way that I'm going to be able to get chapter and verse through books like Amos coming up with Hosea, things such as that. So the notes will have everything. A book like this, I get to kind of uh, give you the, the things that really stand out to me. And so um, in the very first part, you're going to see a couple pictures. You're going to see Herodian. Um, this is about 10 miles uh, south of Jerusalem and about six miles east of Bethlehem. The reason I show that to you, because in the picture, you're going to see some... Um, housing in the background of this picture and it's Tekoa. It's where our Amos is from. Uh, also, you're going to see another picture uh, and this is just a snapshot so you'll remember it as we go through here. This is the area of Tel Dan and remember Jeroboam creates uh, false centers of worship in both Bethel as well as Dan and this is what you would see there today if you were to make your way up to that northernmost border of Israel. So with that, let's take a look at Amos chapter 1. A couple things that stand out. It says, The words of Amos, who was among the sheep breeders of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, the king of Israel, years before the earthquake. So, setting, Amos, he's from Tekoa, it's in the south, and yet God calls him to be a prophet to the north. Just a reminder, I know you know this, but it's good to remind ourselves at this time, David's united kingdom as well as Solomon has been divided. When Solomon dies, the kingdom is split in two. You have 10 of the 12 tribes going to the north and they set up under Jeroboam, they set, set up centers of worship in order to keep the people from making their way to Jerusalem. That's going to be the heart of the issue here. This, that's the northern tribes, also referred to as Ephraim, Israel. Um, what else comes to mind that's describing the northern tribes? Uh, I think that's about it. That's what we run into in the scriptures. And so uh, that's the setting. Now, the, oh, by the way, Tekoa is sort of John the Baptist territory as well. But as we go through and see the depiction of Amos, he's sort of a country bumpkin. Uh, at least he would be to those up north. He tells us that he's a sheep breeder. He doesn't even use the word shepherd because 
if somebody claims to be the shepherd in Israel or shepherd, it's, it's taken on a different meaning because of David and different things like that. So he says, no, 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 no. I'm an everyday guy. I'm a farmer. I'm a fig picker. I, I raise and breed sheep. That's what I do. And so despite the fact that he might be somewhat of, again, the perception of a country bumpkin, I used the example last night in our study that if, it, if you were in a traditional church where the pastor uh, normally wears a suit and tie, um, you would recognize Amos when he came in if he were to speak because he would come in with tennis shoes and blue jeans and a, a, a rolled up denim shirt probably. Again, picture that in your minds. And yet by saying that, I, I don't want you to presume that being a farmer or a sheep breeder or a fig picker that he was less than intelligent, a bumpkin of sort, because his Hebrew is impeccable. And again, this is the first of the prophets. We've covered Obadiah, we've covered Joel, we've covered Jonah, and this will be the first prophet that puts pen to paper. So that's the background. We'll, we'll, we'll get some slanted and slanderous comments about uh, Amos from the perception of the false priests up north later on in the study. So as I said, what I'm doing is I'm kind of going through and giving you the high points. The first couple chapters are very interesting and, and I'm going to ask you to make your way in your PowerPoint to the slide which has the map. And it has a map and it has Damascus, Gaza, Tyre, Edom, Ammon, and Moab. It has red arrows, okay? When you're there, now you're going to understand the strategy of Amos because he starts off in these first two chapters with judgment of God for the three sins of Damascus and four. That means there weren't just three, but but that concept that phrase means the totality of all of this this is what i'm going to do and notice where damascus is and then next up is gaza so we've got damascus in the northeastern sector gaza on the med way down southwest tyre uh, once again, back to the north, all the way even across the border of Israel on the Med. And then Edom, and Edom is going to be in the area of Petra or Basra. Uh, we've talked about the Edomites when we went through Obadiah. And then you have Ammon and Moab and see all that. But I want you to notice on the picture I've given you the two bullseyes because you can almost hear the the, the people as, as this blue jean tennis shoe prophet shows up and he starts in on prophesying, ranting against Damascus, Gaza, Tyre, Edom, Ammon, and Moab. And they're probably going, that's right, that's right, that's right. Little do they realize that he's just setting them up because he still has two yet to go. And those are the bullseyes that you see in the picture. So he sort of created a circle around them and now he's gonna strike. So we wanna know what the three transgressions of Judah and for four, he says, I will not turn away its punishment. And then here's a phrase that we wanna camp on because they have despised the law of the Lord and they have not kept his commandments. Now I have a note here that says, you know, we find it easy and comfortable to expose and rebuke the sins of those who aren't the followers of God. Damascus, Tyre, Ammon, Moab, Gaza, right? That's what Amos does in those six pronouncements of judgment. But just as Amos went on to look at sin among God's people, we need to do the same. And there's that phrase again, 
despising the word of the Lord, despising the law of the Lord. What's that mean? I'm afraid that it's not just callousness. It's not just ignoring. I think that Judah had got to the point where they did not care to hear what God had to say. They didn't need no dang prophet to tell them anything about God's ways. They were fine without him. They despised the law of the Lord. And I wonder in our culture, remember the words of the prophet speak to our world, our culture, collectively the church and to ourselves. But I wonder today if our culture here in America despises the word of God. Well, he goes on. Now he's going to point his arrows at Israel. This is where he was called to prophesy. He says, for three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not turn away its punishment. Why? Because they sell the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of sandals. They pant after the dust of the earth, which is on the head of the poor, and pervert the way of the humble. A man and his father go into the same girl to defile his holy name. They lie down by every altar on clothes taken in pledge. And they drink the wine of the condemned in the house of their God. It got so bad that those in the north had forgotten, despised, could care less about God and his word, and they were assimilated into the worship of other gods, temple process. That's what it's talking about here, that it got so bad that a father and a son would have sex with the same woman. That's a temple prostitute. And then the picture that he gives here, it says, and by the way, they lie down by every altar on clothes taken in pledge. That might not make a whole lot of sense to us, but back then, we read in Exodus Exodus 22 that if the poor, and again, notice the first part of this punishment is that they sell the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of sandals. There's no care about the poor and needy here. And in fact, Exodus tells us that if someone was poor and came to you and wanted to work in your fields or, or grind flour or whatever and borrowed something for you to do that task, he would have to leave his cloak with you as a pledge but exodus 22 says no matter what every evening you need to give that back to him because that is his warmth his clothing maybe his his tent in a sense might be what protects him in the evening as he sleeps but no here it says not only do they not care they've taken these Garments and they use them in the temple prostitute areas of laying down. I, I mean, that's how callous that they've become to those around them. That then in in our study last night, I wanted to get definitions. By the way, of a couple things that I want to insert here right now. We need to talk about justice. We need to talk about righteousness. And we need to understand the difference between conviction and condemnation because this is a searing book. And my desire is not that you feel condemned as you read through here. But on the other hand, the Holy Spirit does convict us of our shortcomings. There's a difference because the devil condemns But the Holy Spirit convicts. He wants to restore us. He wants to encourage us to make changes. Not shame us. Not kick us to the curb. Not 
piling shame and guilt and condemnation upon us. But we need to be open to the word of the Lord. We, we cannot despise his word. And so then there's the nature of justice. A lot of definitions of justice, but at the heart of it, it's making sure that we have right relationships, that there's fairness, that we care about those that are in need. Righteousness, you know, sometimes that is, it's like a spiritual world word. But righteousness is simply, we need to be doing the right thing. It's a good definition of righteousness. So as we go through here, let's make sure that we understand these themes. There's no desire on my part to shame or guilt anyone. But if I have a finger that seems to be pointed, make sure you understand I got a heck of a lot more of those pointing right back at me. I want God to speak to our hearts I want the words of the prophets that may even be written on the subway walls to penetrate us, that we might hear the word of the Lord. Well, more on that as we go. Skip ahead to Amos chapter 3, verse 7, where it says, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret." to his servants, the prophets. A lion is roared, who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken, who can but prophesy? This is not meant to be a mystery. God is not gonna cloak these things in darkness, give us riddles we can't understand. The one thing about the Holy Spirit is if we, you know that phrase, uh, if we ask, he will tell. And so if we lay ourselves out before God and say, Holy Spirit, point out my shortcomings. Holy Spirit, guide me. Holy Spirit, what are some things in my life I need to get rid of? Uh, if you're not willing to listen and be obedient, you might not want to ask those questions because Jesus tells us that it's his job to convict us and to bring to mind what Jesus said. He will guide us in truth. So whether it's a prophet that's inspired by God to speak or whether it's the spirit of God that dwells in you, surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secrets to his people. We might not like it by the way, but the words of the prophets will be spoken and the words are there. It's not an issue of there's no words. The issue is always going to be in the hearing, not just the speaking. That's why the Bible emphasizes the importance of hearing. He who has an ear, let him hear. Uh, the, the bedrock prayer of Jews today still in this day. In fact, when Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus quotes the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord your God is one. You shall love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That first word is Shema. That literally means hear. Hear the word of the Lord. Sometimes our eyes betray us but we need to hear the word of God. Remember Jesus said concerning the times in which we're living, the seasons that we're in, he said to the Pharisees and Sadducees when they came testing him and asking him for signs, they said, he says to them, you know how to read the signs of nature when it's evening, you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red. But in the morning, if it's a red sky, it's going to be a foul weather. And then he goes on, he says, hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the times of the signs or the signs of the times. We need to be aware 
of what the Bible teaches about what's going on in our world, in our culture, in our churches, and in our own lives. God does reveal. Amos 4, the beginning of it, again, back to this concept of um, callousness, a lack of justice, unrighteousness. Those are the themes. He says, hear the word of the Lord, you cows of Bashan, who are in the mountains of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to their husbands, bring wine, let us drink. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness. Behold, the day shall come upon you when he will take you away with fish hooks and your posterity with fish hooks. Insensitivity. In a moment, we're going to read about woe to those that live at ease. This is a word picture here. And Amos is pointing his finger at women who have no compassion whatsoever. He calls them the cows of Bashan. But then he says, the days are coming when he will take you away with fish hooks. Remember, during this time, Jeroboam II is in control. The prophets have, by the way, there's never a good king in the north. There's a couple of good kings in the south, but there's never a good king in the north. So the prophets are always going to lambast any northern king. But Jeroboam, under his guidance and kingship, a uh, brilliant strategist, military leader. The times in Israel, in the north right now, are prosperous. Things are going well, okay? Which is why the, the prophet is blasting them with their non-concern for those that are in need. It's not like they didn't have enough. They just wanted more, more. More, They despise the word of the Lord and they despise the needy. They sold them like what? A pair, for a pair of sandals. That's what's going on. And so this is in the 700s. It's in 722. This is about 750 uh, AD, BC. And 20, 30 years later, what we just read in verse 2 literally took place. We talked about the Assyrians last week and why Jonah wouldn't, didn't want to have anything to do with them, how barbaric they were. They were known for skinning alive. They would go, they would take a city or a village or a town, they would skin people alive. They put the skin over the walls, they'd cut off heads, they'd rape the women. Uh, when the Assyrians were on the move, there are a lot of villages in Israel that, that did the same as Masada and had mass suicides, not wanting the barbaric nature of the Assyrians to rain down upon them. And so literally we have, we have reliefs where, where the Assyrians are depicted leading people out the leaders of the city with fish hooks that went up through their, the base of their chin out their mouths. Barbaric. But this literally is what took place. And we're going to find that during the Assyrian assaults, Israel, those 10 tribes, lose their identity. That's why as we go through here... Amos is going to say, through God, he's going to say, that's it. You're done. Prepare to meet your God. Fortunately, at the end, this book's going to end on a note of grace because no matter the totality of judgment, God always has a way of preserving a remnant. And we'll get to that. So in 2 Chronicles 33, 11, I just gave you a, a snapshot, a glimpse 
of what I referred to. It says under Manasseh, it says, so the, the Lord brought against them the com- an army commanders of the king of Assyria who took Manasseh a prisoner. And what did he do? He put a hook through his nose. He bound him with bronze shackles and he took him away. And so what's next is verse 4, chapter 4, 4, come to Bethel and transgress. At Gilgal, multiply transgressions. Bring your articles or your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days. And then is the phrase, and offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving. And notice what it says, with leaven. God's going to go on through this and say, I hate your religious ceremonies. I hate your songs. I want you to do justice and love righteousness. But here, we see that you can be religious and still distant from God. That whole concept of adding leaven. I was listening to One of my favorite Bible teachers, Joe Faust, teaching on Amos, and he stopped here, he paused, he says, you know, the greatest enemies of God, the greatest traitors in the world today are those who are not ISIS or a a jihadist iman or whatever, but it's those that occupy the pulpits who simply preach sermonettes to Christianettes. They're just simply adding leaven to the word of God. Let's just make the word more culturally relevant. Traitors. It's the last thing we need. All right. Let's go ahead and go to verse 9 because God's going to say, you know what? I loved you enough to try to call you back to myself. So I withheld rain. I, I, I allowed a famine to take place here. It says, I, I blasted you with blight and mildew. Uh, verse 10 says, I sent a plague after the manner of Egypt. We talked about locusts. And then the words, yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. This was the greatest tragedy. The failure to return to the Lord. Anybody can stumble and fall, right? Anybody can stumble, fall, repent, sort of feel the correcting hand of God, but we're in far greater trouble when we sense God's correction in our lives, but we put it off and we do not return to him. I always teach, you know, whenever we talk about revival, we always go to that go-to passage of 2 Chronicles 7.14. If my people are called by my name, will humble themselves will seek my face, will turn from their wicked ways. Then I'll hear from heaven. I'll heal the land. And what most people throw that out, they don't realize, but judgment begins where? In the household of God. And that portion of scripture does not say if the ungodly will turn to me. No, it's if my people will. That's why when I talk about the words of these prophets that are going out, we just don't want to be like the chapters one and two where we're looking at those on the outside saying, I hope they're hearing this. I hope they're hearing this. No, it's that circle and it's smack dab in the middle of that word that comes to us. So it's not just hearing the words of the prophet for the world or our culture or collectively what we call the church, but what about me? Where am I at? Verse 11, he says, I overthrew some of you. And then he goes on in verse 12, as I said, he's done. And he says, therefore, thus I will do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you. Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. 
We're at the end. No more room. Grace has been extended. Judgment is long overdue here. And Amos is going to say, time is up. And those words, prepare to meet your God. You know, it was years ago that I remember reading this quote from Billy Graham that says, America is long overdue for judgment. If God doesn't judge America, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. And then I read this as it continued. Today, we have outlawed prayer in our schools. Our textbook for children deny God as creator. Our nation is steeped in sexual sin, perversely affirming homosexuality, the insanity of a reprobate mind. We make laws to criminalize righteousness and to legalize gross evil. A nation like that, prepare to meet your God. Paul says in the end of days as he writes to the Thessalonians, understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, and having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power, and he says, avoid such people. I don't think there is a clear depiction of our world today than the light that Paul sheds upon the godlessness of our world in these days, in the days that we call the end of days, last times. Well, in the midst of all this, even though Amos is saying, prepare to meet your God, there will be a remnant. There will be mass casualties, but still the heart of God in Amos 5.14 says, Seek good and not evil, that you may live. So the Lord God of hosts will be with you as you have spoken. Hate evil, love good, establish justice in the gates. Do you hear that word? Will God reveal to us through the prophets or through his spirit what it means to seek good, not evil? Or how about this phrase, hate evil and love good? I often remember a sermon when I was a young Christian and the question was, how do I please God? How do I grow? How do, we, how do I become more like Jesus? And, and the speaker said, well, you need to love the things that Jesus loves. Well, how do I know what that is? Read your Bible, study your Bible. You'll get the answer. Love the things that Jesus loves. And I, I, I remember, I'm all in, I can do that. But there's the other side of the coin that's just as important and maybe be much harder. You need to love the things that Jesus loves, but you need to hate the things that Jesus hates. And I wonder in our culture today, as perverse as it's becoming, that there's a difference in believers that we want to still love the things that Jesus loves, but we tolerate the things that Jesus hates. We don't speak out against it. I wonder if that's why the gospel seems weakened in our day. Just something to think about. Amos 5, again, back to that theme of religiosity. 
adding leaven to an offering, God's going to say in verse 21, I hate, I despise your feast days. I do not savor your sacred assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them. Nor will I regard your fattened peace offerings. Take away from me the noise of your songs. For I will not hear the melody of your stringed instruments. But, and here's that thread that's woven through. But, let justice run down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. God saw all that Israel did. He saw their feast days and all this was nothing as long as there was no justice or no righteousness in their dealings with others. Let justice roll down. You know, it's easy sometimes to separate our religious ceremonies from the way we treat others. And to think that God should simply be happy if we give him his due. I go to church, I give, I tithe. He should just be happy with that. But the truth is that without justice and without righteousness towards others, God will have nothing to do with our religiosity. Amos 6 is that phrase I was referring to earlier. Woe to you who are at ease in Zion and you trust in Mount Samaria. This has to do with self-indulgence. This has to do with pride, luxury. A couple quotes. You know, it wouldn't be a an old-fashioned Bible study if I didn't quote Spurgeon somewhere, right? So Spurgeon says about ease in Zion, he says, self-indulgence. Oh, this is the God of so many. They live not for Christ. What do they need for him? They live not for his church. What care they for that? They live for self and self only. And they mark, (coughs) excuse me, and mark there are such, not just among the rich or the well-to-do, but among the poor as well. For all classes have this evil leaven. And her pride and luxury All Israel saw it was ease. This indulgent lust for comfort, for luxury is a sin and God promises to judge it. And then a last quote from Spurgeon. This is the ease of a madman who has hidden his sin even from his own eyes. He thinks he has concealed it from God. It is the ease and peace of one who has grown calloused, hardened, brutalized, stupid, sullen, and careless, who has begun a sleep which God grant may soon be broken or else it will surely bring him where he shall make his bed in hell. Woe to those who are at ease, who spiritually are laid back, who simply just want enough. And that's always just a little bit more. I can't, I, I, I can't care about anyone else other than meeting my own needs. The curse of our age is entitlement, and self-indulgence. And God speaks to that here in Amos. We're going to skip to Amos chapter 7, verses 10. Um, 
Remember I spoke earlier about one of the professional prophets of the North, a hireling, no doubt. His name's Amaziah. He's a priest in Bethel. And you know what? Amos has been impactful and Amaziah's had enough. So we learn a little bit more about Amos here because then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, he he speaks to Jeroboam, the king of Israel, and he says, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. And then he makes this statement, the land is not able to bear all his words. Pause, reflect, think, say la, for I fear this to be true of our country as well. The land can't handle the word of God. What God's word is saying about how we're to live, right and wrong, truth, And then he says to Jeroboam, we got to get rid of this guy, right? So he says, um, because Amos has actually said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword and Israel shall surely be led away captive from their own land. And then Amaziah says to Amos, go. Amaziah is saying to Amos, get out of here, man. You're just a fig picker and a sheep herder. Go back to where you came from. Go, you seer, flee to the land of Judah. There eat bread, there prophesy, but never again prophesy at Bethel, for it's the king's sanctuary. It's his royal residence. And Amos answers and says, I was no prophet, nor was I a son of a prophet. I was a sheep breeder, a a tender of sycamore fruit. And then the Lord took me as I followed the flock and the Lord said to me, go prophesy to my people Israel. Now therefore hear the word of the Lord. You say, do not prophesy against Israel. Do not spout against the house of Isaac. Therefore, I'd love to see this scene. Therefore, as Amos is looking at Amaziah, therefore your wife shall be a harlot in the city. Your sons and daughters shall fall by the sword. Your land shall be divided by a survey line. You shall die in a defiled land and Israel shall surely be led captive from his own land. And that's exactly what took place. Chapter eight. Again, now we're going to see the end and yet a remnant. Thus says the Lord God, behold, a basket of summer fruit. And he said to Amos, what do you see? And I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then the Lord said to me, the end has come. Upon my people Israel, I will not pass by them anymore. And the songs of the temple shall be wailing in that day, says the Lord God. Many dead bodies everywhere. They shall be thrown out in silence. Summer fruit, ripe fruit, soon to be rotten fruit. Good for nothing. That's the condition of Israel. The end has come for my people Israel. And part of that end has to do with what we read in Amos 8, 9 through 11, and it may be something we need to hear. Because he says, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine for bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Notice carefully the nature of this famine. It's not a lack of God's word, but it's the inability to hear the word of the Lord. Hmm. The conditions that's described is that of being deaf to the words of Yahweh. 
Jehovah, to not be able to hear them. It's not a case of God withholding his revelation, but of people being in such a state that they would not want anything to do with it nor hear his words. They despised my words. The land cannot bear the word of the Lord. I wonder if that's the age that we're currently living in. We don't want to know what your stupid Bible says about this. It's not relevant. We've passed it. It's ancient writings. It's for generations in the past. We're more enlightened. No, we're more depraved. The end is coming. F.B. Meyer commentator writes this, we may question whether we feed enough on God's word. To grow strong, we must feed not on condiments and sweet meats, not on tidbits and scraps, not on pious phrases and sentences, but on the strong meat of the word of God, on the doctrines, on the histories, on the types that we find in scripture. Oh, for more hunger and thirst for these. And even though we just read concerning the end, I'm done. There's still Seek me and live, hate evil, love good, follow me. God still preserves a remnant. And in the last chapter, in this scathing book, interestingly enough, we end on a note of grace, hope, light, the promises of God, never failing, keeps covenant. Chapter 11, I mean, chapter 9, verse 11 says, On that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I'll repair its damages. I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does this thing. What a transition uh, from uh, the, the sword of the Lord in judgment making way to a trowel of reconstruction. We're going to raise up once again the tabernacle of David. And, and it's not just going to be the fulfillment or the promises of God to Israel and, and calling them back in 1948, they're in the land as we know, right? It's not just that because here we see this note, I'm going to rebuild it. I'm going to raise it up from its ruins. I'm going to repair its damages and all the Gentiles are going to be a part who are called by my name. This is millennial. This is the age. There's been no other time before 1948 that this has been true. Israel is back in the land. God is rebuilding these cities, these ancient places. He's going to fulfill his promises. He will fulfill them. Then it goes on and it simply ends by saying, you ain't seen nothing yet. And he talks about, I'm going to bring the captives of my people Israel. They shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards. They'll drink wine from them. They shall also make gardens and eat fruit from them. I will plant them in their land. And no longer shall they be pulled up for the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. The land that I have given them. Israel's back in the land. We read about this uh, uh, abundance of, of produce. And, and did you know that, that the Jordan Valley in, in Israel today, in the Valley of Jezreel, produces more per acre than anywhere else in the world. And that wasn't true pre-1948. It was only when the people of God got back to the land 
that the land begin producing in this manner. Again, the harshness of this book. Can't take away from that. But it ends with grace. God knows, God cares, God calls. And he who has an ear, let him hear. God corrects. God convicts. He doesn't ignore. Today, Lord Jesus, may your church shine brighter than ever before. May we be dispensers of the word of God. Surely, God does reveal through his spirit and the prophets and those who claim his name. Jesus, we want to walk with you in these days and we continue to pray for at least one last great revival. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Hope to see you next week as we tackle the book of Hosea. Shalom.